wanted to work at NASA. So I was like, at least I could work at NASA and be a scientist. So I continued to work hard through high school and uh, study as much as I could in math and science. And then I also did well in my English classes and my history classes. And I enjoyed sports and uh, I was in the choir. And then I went to college and I studied geology. And I did two summer internships um, working outdoors for about five to six weeks and really enjoyed that time. And then I went back to school and became a high school teacher. And I taught high school for five years in Vancouver, Washington. And it was when I was teaching high school that one of my students said, well, how do you go to the bathroom in space? And I didn't know what the toilet looked like um, for the, the space shuttle. So we went and Googled it, and we found a presentation that explained how the toilet worked. But I also found uh, a link to the application to become an astronaut. So I applied to become an astronaut, and I went through a series of physical testing and medical testing and an interview process and got to do some tours while I was down at Johnson Space Center in Houston and I waited for about six months and I found out that I had been selected to become an astronaut. So I started my training ten years ago um, and uh, I, I was a lot like you guys. I was a student. I learned all about the space shuttle, all the systems, the uh, how it produces electricity, how it had life support so that we could live and the space shuttle, um, how it had hydraulics that moved its aero surfaces. So I learned all about these systems. And uh, then we were in simulators. We had to practice if things failed and how to, how to solve those problems. And then we, we went into a more advanced training where we learned about robotics and we flew the robotic arm in simulators. And we did some spacewalk training in a big swimming pool that's 40 feet deep and hundreds of feet wide and, and long and has a, a mock-up of the space station in it. So we did all this training, and then um, on April 5th of 2010, I joined six other crew members to fly in space for 15 days. So I'm going to share a little bit about that mission, and then open it up to questions about living in space. Okay, well, this is our patch. This is what identifies us, just like you guys have a school mascot that identifies you. This is this is what made us stand out as SKS 131, and this is the launch pad on April 5th. Our commander, Alan Poindexter from the Navy, Jim Dutton from the Air Force, Rick Mastracchio as an engineer, myself as a former high school teacher and scientist, Clay as a physicist, Stephanie as an engineer, and Naoko Yamazaki from the Japanese Space Agency, also an engineer. So we walked out to um, in the early morning hours, probably like around three in the morning. Uh, got in a silver van that took us out to the launch pad. And the launch pad is about three and a half miles away from all the people watching you go into space. Because if they were any closer, they would die. So they have to be far away from the launch pad. Um, yep, that's how it is. So there I am. I'm the flight engineer on the, the flight deck. I help run all the checklists to get us safely to ASA. So the main engine's light. Come up to full thrust. There we go. Once these solid rocket boosters light, you are headed to space. They provide the majority of the thrust until about two and a half minutes into the flight. And then at two and a half minutes, they come off of the vehicle and they fall back into the ocean. And we continue on this big orange tank. So the orange tank has hydrogen and oxygen get, uh, liquids in them. Those liquids combine in the main engine and they react. And their reaction is violent. It causes the energy that allows us to continue thrusting up into space. And then it also makes a byproduct of water. So here we are. Um, the first few minutes you're bouncing around in the seat a lot. It's kind of like a, a fast roller coaster. You feel that energy. And then once those solid rocket boosters fall off, it smooths out. The main engines are able to gimbal. That means they move around and they can keep you on a smooth trajectory. So then it becomes a smooth ride. The last, um, uh, it's, a, it's an eight and a half minute ride. The last minute you start to pull three G's, which means you pull three times Earth's gravity. So it feels like someone's sitting on your chest and you're getting heavier and heavier. And then all of a sudden the main engines shut off and you float up in your seat belts. And that big orange tank drops back to Earth. There you can see it falling back to Earth. It'll tumble in the atmosphere. And as it tumbles to the atmosphere, it'll rip it apart and it'll turn into a bunch of dust. And no one will ever, ever see the big pieces anymore. 
But we have to turn our spaceship into a place to live for the next 15 days. So we open the payload bay doors, which allow the vehicle to cool. And then uh, we started getting right down to work. So on day two, um, I was part of the robotic team. And we flew the robotic arm to pick up an extension um, that, that took pictures along the wing leading edge and all the tiles underneath our shuttle. There's all these tiles that protect us as we re-enter um, and land. So we had to check those things out, make sure they're all safe. Because unfortunately, we lost the Columbia Space Shuttle because there was damage to that. So that's what we learned from that, is that we want to make sure our, our system is, is protected. Well, on the third day, we prepared to rendezvous with the space station. So here we're doing a burn, and you can see when we do a burn, it's an acceleration, and it causes things like M&M packets to float to the back of the space shuttle. Um, but the rendezvous team was on the flight deck. It was the commander, pilot, Stephanie, and uh, Clay. Those four people were our rendezvous team. And they make sure that we put in the right burns that raise our altitude to, to dock with the space station. So we do these series of burns. We come up underneath the space station. We flip around. And they take pictures of all of our tiles again, because it's really important to make sure those tiles are safe. So they take a series of pictures. And then we come up on what we call the velocity bar. We come up in front of the space station. And we bring ourselves in to dock with the space station. So right then, the shuttle and the space station dock together. A couple of initial hooks grab on, and then we drive a series of additional hooks to pull the two vehicles together. These vehicles weigh a lot. It's more than a million pounds of, of equipment pulled together there. So they're, um, the hooks drive in, then we have two hatches. There's equalization across the hatches. We have to let the air pressure be equal on both sides so that they'll open. And then we are able to open the hatch. It actually happens a couple hours later, but it looks like minutes here. Um, we open up the hatches, and if you listen carefully, you're going to hear three languages here. Hello. Uh, we had two Japanese astronauts meeting in space for the first time. Um, our Russian colleagues always have a presence on the space station, and then the American and European astronauts. So here we are, and you can see the space station is a very different place. I mean, you can hang up, hang out on every surface. Um, there's no up or down in space. Well, on the fourth day, we had to uh, get this big payload out of our payload bay. That big silver container is essentially like a U-Haul. It's full of equipment and stuff that we need on the space station. Things like food, water, payloads, like lots of science. Um, a new crew quarters. We were still building the space station at this point, so we had a brand new crew quarters that we were delivering. So you can see moving things in space is much easier than moving things on Earth. These, some of these uh, pieces of equipment weigh about two or 300 pounds, and you can just move them along with your fingertips in space. It's pretty cool. Uh, and we can make a big mess, and we can go lots of places. You can slip behind um, mod, you know, racks. Here Jim is squeezing behind racks that you could never get to on Earth because you're in a 1G environment, and everything falls to the ground. And, we're all attached to the surface of the Earth. <laughs> so we did a series of three spacewalks, and Rick and Claire are putting on their oxygen mask here. They're preparing to go out to a lower pressure. See, they'll wear a spacesuit, and that spacesuit will have pure oxygen around them, but they'll, it'll be at a lower pressure. It'll only be at 4 PSI rather than 14.7 PSI. So they breathe that pure oxygen to get all the nitrogen out of their blood so that they don't have what happens is called the bends, and it's, scuba divers can experience the bends but it's a similar um, application as if a scuba diver were ascending through the water while well, it's like going out on a spacewalk is like ascending through the water. So they went out for three spacewalks. This is the first one where they took this big uh, rectangular box there. That's an ammonia tank. That's a brand new ammonia tank. They handed it over to the robotic arm and Stephanie and Jim were inside flying that robotic arm so they, took, they flew the arm to put the new tank somewhere on the space station that just kept it in a temporary position. And then they took out the failed, so this is the failed um, ammonia tank. And while they were taking out the failed ammonia tank, Rick and Clay were moving this cart to prepare a temporary location to put the failed tank. And we had to do these handoffs because that robotic arm is only so long. It can't cover the whole station and the shuttle. It, they had to walk off and and move around. So that's why we had to do these series of spacewalks. 
And so here's the failed tank. They're going to attach it to the seat of cart on the front of the space station with just six straps of material. They are, they're special straps. They are made of strong material, but it's pretty amazing that 2,000 pounds can be held into location with just six straps. Well, everything was going really well. We were getting ready to put the new ammonia tank back into place, and then we ran into this problem where um, we had some soft docks. Little so soft docks allow the ammonia tank to attach to the station temporarily. Then you have to drive bolts to hold it in permanently. Well, the soft docks that were supposed to temporarily hold it, they froze out and they wouldn't move and they were gouging the tank and we couldn't get, we couldn't overcome them. We couldn't get the tank to, to lay flush where it needed to. So we tried using a pry bar. We tried using um, something like a flathead screwdriver. We even tried this little space hammer but nothing could get these, uh, the tank to go flush up with the station so we could drive the bolts. So what we finally had to do was have Rick pull out the whole tank, hold it there for a while so it became thermally stable, and then Clay shoved it in with his arm and he got it to, to overcome those soft docks. So once we did that, we drove the bolts and then we hooked it up to the ammonia and nitrogen and everything was great and it checked out fine. So we, we overcame our problem. And then this is the failed tank as we put it back into the payload bay. So again, about 21 hours of work outside on spacewalks for us over three different days. And then we have to clean up all of our materials and we bring the guys in. And you can see that hatch. That hatch keeps them from us. So we can be in it inside the space station at 14.7 PSI and they can be down at vacuum in that airlock. And then we bring, we, we pump air into the airlock bring the pressure up equal and open the hatch and bring them inside. So they are ready to get out of those suits because they've been in them for six and a half to seven hours and all they've had is a drink bag in the front of their suit to, to get water from. So they are tired and they're thirsty. So we get them out of their suits and bring them inside. Well, meanwhile, while they've been doing the spacewalks, um, our, our space station crew members <coughs> have been doing science and they've been transferring these um, samples, uh, a lot of human samples from blood and urine from the freezers of the space station to the freezers on the shuttle. So you can see these things are really cold. They're at minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's super cold. And then um, scientists down here on the Earth will study uh, the, the blood and the urine. They'll learn more about how our body reacts to uh, microgravity, what things happen to it. We know that, for instance, um, our body decreases its ability to fight disease. We know that we lose bone mass, so they'll learn a lot from those samples back here on Earth. Well, part of living on station means making a mess, and here we're showing Rick cleaning up some of the messes. You know, food on the Earth falls to the floor, and you know where to clean it up, but food in space flies everywhere, and it makes a mess on the walls and ceilings, so you got to clean lots of surfaces. Uh, here's a quick little demo that um, in space things have to be separated through centrifuges. So he spun that juice and all the gases which are less dense went to the center of the juice and the more dense liquid spun to the outside. And then Naoko is demonstrating um, surface tension. So things in space um, that are liquids, they behave like this where they make um, circle or globe spheres. And uh, there's a cherry blossom. Naoko brought up dried cherry blossoms from Japan because that symbolizes her country. And she put it here in the water. And it's really pretty. And then you can direct things around. You know, Newton's laws apply everywhere. And so she was redirecting that bubble with a force. But it, she, she was a little too forceful. It split up into multiple water droplets. Um, we don't get a lot of free time on the space station, but when we did have some free time, we tried to enjoy meals together. There were 13 of us up there, six International Space Station crew members and seven shuttle crew members. So we had um, a Russian dinner, an American dinner, and a Japanese dinner, and here we were having sushi. They uh, brought up some um, oh, uh, about seaweed and some rice, and then we had uh, rehydrated shrimp, and we had canned mackerel. We really enjoyed that. Well, exercising is really important in space. Like I said, your, your bones start to um, break down into your body and your muscles get atrophied, and so you need to exercise in space. And another thing that happens to you in space is you grow taller. So here we were measuring that we were growing taller in space, that we got anywhere between a quarter of an inch to an inch taller in space. 
we uh, definitely have to rest at the end of the day. So here are our sleeping bags. Our commander was on the, the flight deck. Our pilot was on the floor. Uh, Rick and Clay found spots on the, uh, the walls. I think Stephanie was on the ceiling. We don't have her here. I squeezed in between some bags. You just try, try to find a, pl a good place to put your sleeping bag. You have to attach it down, otherwise it'll float away. And uh, you enjoy the evening. But as you saw, we wore those sleep masks because we go around the earth every 90 minutes. And so there's um, a sunrise and a sunset every 45 minutes. So you need to have a sleep mask to keep out the ambient light. Well, here we're coming across the southern United States. And you see all those cities at night. Probably coming across Georgia right now. Um, but the, you can see all the highways and all the cities that are connected. And then we're coming across the Atlantic. We experience sunrise first because um, we're 200 miles above the Earth, and then minutes later, you'll see sunrise down on the Earth's surface. One of our favorite things to do is to look out the window during our free time. It's a, such a beautiful scene. So here we're coming over Georgia and then Florida, and then over um, the Caribbean islands, so you can see those really beautiful blues. It's really, it's really amazing. These are thunderstorms in southern Australia. You can see some city lights. And then eventually you'll see the green glow of the aurora australis. So you'll see that interaction with the sun's ions with our upper atmosphere. But you can't always be looking out the window. There's a lot of work to get done, including um, I told you how we were bringing that six tons of equipment up and we needed to, to transfer that over to the space station. So um, a lot of that equipment is heavy, and one of the pieces that we brought up was this big 900-pound uh, rack. So this is the 900-pound rack that Naoko's transferring here. So I bet Naoko only weighs 100 pounds at the most, and she's moving something that's 900 pounds in space. It's pretty cool. This rack has uh, the outlets for uh, data transfer for special cameras, cameras that can take pictures in the infrared and see things on Earth that help us um, Put, plant better crops, put them in the areas that are best for them, um, helps us understand natural disasters like floods or mudslides or um, fl uh, snowstorms that have blocked roads so we can better help people on the earth. So that's what that, that rack is for. Well, we, we transferred those six tons of equipment and we returned um, 2,000 pounds of trash and old hardware that didn't, was no longer used that we needed to bring home. We sealed back up the multi-purpose logistics module, and then Naoko and Stephanie flew the robotic arm and put it back into the payload bay. So you can see there, there's not a lot of clearance. It's probably six to eight inches on either side of that module before they put it back into the payload bay. And it's time to say goodbye. So we have a tra tradition of hanging our patch on the wall. We bring stickers up and we stick them to the wall. The commanders, Alec and Dex, are saying goodbye to each other. Um, the crews are saying goodbye to each other. And then everyone in the blue will be on the shuttle to the front of the station, and everyone in maroon will be in the back. So that bell, there's a Navy bell on board the space station, and it says, we're leaving. And our pilot now is um, doing a series of little burns that back us out away from the station. And then we fly a lap around the space station and we take photos of it to show engineers back on the Earth so they can see what we've done while we've been there, while we were doing our spacewalks. And also they can see if there's anything that's happened to the space station since the last shuttle flight. So uh, here we come across the Cape Hatteras, which is up in the upper left-hand corner, and we're coming across the Atlantic Ocean. It's really beautiful. Well, just before we pull away, um, the folks on the space station still had a good view of us, and they were able to snap some, some pictures, and then we continued to, uh, to pull away. So they got our picture. We said goodbye. Some of them wouldn't return for another six months. They had just gotten there, so they had six more months to live on the space station. Um, well, we have to close our payload bay doors so that we'll get ready to come back home. 
and we have to get back into our orange suits because those help protect us in case there were an emergency in the shuttle. And we all get strapped back into our seats and then we are ready to start heading home. So we, we've done a deorbit burn that slows us down and we start to come back into the Earth's atmosphere. And as we come back into the atmosphere, we start to heat up. And you can see that orange glow out the window. That is because we are heating up to two to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. So that's when those tiles become really important because they help reject that heat so that we do not um, start on fire, so that we're safe as we come back through the atmosphere. So here we come into Florida. We're still slowing down. The shuttle doesn't have any engines at this point that can light to slow us down. It's all a glider. So we're gliding around what they call the heading alignment cone, slowing our speed down, using the atmosphere to slow us down. And we go from 17,500 miles per hour to 200 miles per hour to stop on the, on the runway. So that's touchdown at about 200 miles per hour. And then the, the chute comes out. That even slows us down a little bit more. The nose wheel comes through. We are done. And about an hour, hour and a half after we've landed, thrown our last switches, um, gotten some food and water, we were able to come outside, walk around, and go see our families. So it was a really fun mission. And I have a few little outtakes from the mission because we showed all the busy work and the stuff that we were doing, but we had some fun while we were up there too. So one of the things that we do before we take off is we make messages for our family because we know we have a few minutes as we're getting suited up and loaded into the vehicle that we can wave at this camera and send messages back to our family so we won't see them for the next 15 days. So when I left, my daughter was just three and uh, she was just learning how to count down. She, she would never get the two and three in the right spot, so that was a special sign for her. We talked already a little bit about sleeping. Sleeping on orbit is really comfortable because if you think about it, you don't have any of the pressures of the mattress behind your back. You're just floating there, and it's really relaxing. So you get some good sleep on orbit. <laughs> if we're sleeping. <laughs> you have to first get to sleep. Uh, we keep ourselves clean in space. Clay is demonstrating that his way of keeping clean is vacuuming himself. But, but really, we do like uh, we we clean ourselves with wet towels, and we have a no rinse shampoo that we use. I enjoyed flipping around in space. I don't get to do that here on Earth. I'm not very skilled, so it was fun in space. And even though Naoko knows she's not going to fall on this tightrope, she's demonstrating that you can walk a tightrope. It's really tricky. You have to use those toes to really grab that rope and move yourself along it. Well, one night we got a camera spinning at the table, and uh, this is what 13 astronauts and cosmonauts do for fun. Hi. about Clay. Clay is from Nebraska. Oh! <laughs> we don't know what happens in Nebraska. Well, um, the folks that live on a space station for long periods of time have, have different hobbies that they do up there, and some includes making music. And Naoko and Suichi both could play the kato. So the kato is normally a large instrument, but they made a miniature one to fly on the space station so that they could play it here. And then you can see Naoko doing a non-traditional fan dance. <laughs> but we've got pianos, guitars, we've had a didgeridoo, a flute, we've had lots of instruments on the space station. And uh, we, our, our home team, the Astros, was not doing very well, so we decided to, to give them some inspiration and play a little bit of space ball. <laughs> Yes, no, you do not want to damage any of the equipment, so everything was filmed in slow motion. Everything was done in slow motion. <laughs> well, once we return to Florida, our families all live in Houston, so we had to fly an airplane back to Houston, and we, we were in this hangar where we said hello to all the people that had trained us, all the pilots that had flown us around for the year and a half. So it was a really good journey and experience. And at this point, 
I will open it up for questions from you guys. <coughs> yes. What were the first few seconds like before you took off? Oh, the first few seconds. So you get loaded into the vehicle really early. Like we get into the vehicle about um, three hours to two and a half hours prior to the takeoff. So at first you kind of relax because you're you know that you're going to be in the seat for a while. So you kind of you can almost take a little bit of a nap. But then the timeline starts to pick up and they start to do checks. And as the mission specialist, I was following the check. I was making sure all the right checks were taking place. And then once it's 20 minutes before the flight, then you're, the four of us on the flight deck are in the books and we're following along. We have different um, switches we have to throw, different comm checks we have to do. So we're following along with that. And then you like, realize, like, no kidding, like, the weather's good, like, everything's good. We're going to be taking off today, and this is really happening. Something that we've been training for for years is really going to happen. So the butterflies were already there, but then they really start to start moving in your stomach. And then um, just seconds before, when you feel those main engines light before the solid rocket boosters light, you can feel the vehicle kind of sway just a little bit. You're like, oh, my goodness, we're coming. And then, boom, you get the big gold in the back of your, uh, in your back, and you are taking off, and it, it's a lot of energy, it's a lot of shaking in the, the first few seconds, so it's like going on a, a really big roller coaster, I guess, and the, the initial takeoff portion, so it's exciting. Yes? Yeah. Okay. When you were our age, did you ever believe that you were ever going to go in space? No, I, pro I probably, I had that as a dream, but I kind of thought it was just a dream, and so... I set it as a goal, though, and I worked really hard, but I also had lots of other plans, too, along the way. And, and one of those plans was I, I was interested in teaching, too. So um, I had a lot of hobbies and things I was into, um, but I, I kind of had it as, like, yeah, I could do that. But then I thought, well, there's all these other people that could do it, too. So I didn't really think it would necessarily happen. Yeah. Yes? Do you have, like, one person to be your inspiration? Did I have one person that was my inspiration? Well, like I said, um, I remember when Sally Ride flew, but also I remember when um, Krista McAuliffe and the Challenger um, accident happened. So that I, I had just been following along with space shuttle launches. Um, I, I just really admired all the astronauts, really, and uh, respected them and saw them as at the pinnacle of their career and, and going after, doing something that's risky, but doing it for the sake of humanity, for exploration, for understanding ourselves better, and for getting us off of Earth and onto further places in our solar system. So I, I was kind of inspired by all of them. Yeah. Yes? So now, um, well now I help support my friends that are flying in space. So I, I go to meetings and um, talk about what the perspective of an astronaut is, what things are important to them, making sure that they have the right food on orbit, the right um, gear and clothing, making sure that they are familiar with the hardware that's going to fly because they have to do, they have to work with payloads and they don't always get training on the ground for them. So making sure that they're pretty intuitive um, because it's like coming up to any computer or something. You have to be able to know how to, it's going to work. And you guys kind of know how it works because you see the power switches and things like that. So making sure things are built um, right for astronauts. Um, I, I get to go out and talk to other people. I, I love talking to students. I talk to adults, too, about my experiences on orbit. Um, so those are some of the things. I take Russian language still. Um, but uh, the astronauts that are still in current training, they fly in T-38 jets. They're in the pool training for spacewalks. They're practicing robotics. So they do lots of different training things to get ready for their missions. Yes? Are you scared? Was I scared? I was definitely aware that I could die. Like, I knew that it was just a lot of energy in me. So, um, but I wasn't really scared because I, I felt really prepared in the training. So I felt like, probably like I feel before any major athletic event where you've got nervous butterflies, you know you've done the preparation, you're excited about it, but you're also a little worried because you know, like, when I used to run in cross country races, I know that, like, um, things don't always go exactly right. So I was a little nervous. I wanted to make sure that I did things right while I was on orbit. I didn't want to make major mistakes, but I understood I could make mistakes, and I definitely did make mistakes when I was orbit on orbit. But I tried to make sure that they were going to be small ones. Like, if you miss a step, you can always go back and, and talk with the ground and say, hey, I missed this, this step in the checklist. I didn't throw the right switch. Can we 
can we fix that? And yes, they'll come back and say, yeah, there's no problem, you can fix it. So I made those types of mistakes, but I didn't want to make any big mistake, like running the arm into the, the space shuttle. That would be really bad. So, you know, how to mitigate those, those types of um, mistakes that you can make. So I was excited, a little bit nervous. Um, I was going to miss my family, but I was really excited to share with them this new place that they won't have the chance to go visit. So I thought about my daughter a lot. I made some little videos for her. Um, it was just, it was a really cool two weeks. Yes? When those two guys were going out to do that mission, how, they, they were seven hours long, how long did they use the restroom? Did they just do it in a space suit? They do just do it in a space suit. They wear a diaper. They wear a big diaper and space. So, yeah. Yeah. There's nothing glam. There's some, there's some glamour in doing a spacewalk, and then there's some of the non-glamorous part of doing a spacewalk. But, yeah. And, uh... You know, they um, they do only have that water, so they have to eat properly before they go out. And uh, the suit is really amazing because it provides all the oxygen that you need, and it scrubs out the carbon dioxide. It also helps to keep your body temperature regulated. So you wear this long underwear with all these hoses in it, and the hoses have water in them, and the water is pushed around by a pump, and it can keep you warm when you're in the darkness. And then it can also cool you off when you're in the, the, the bright sunlight. So the suit is a really amazing, um, it's like its own vehicle, basically. <coughs> yes? Um, what was your favorite food in space? My favorite food was the macaroni and cheese and the cream spinach. <laughs> Do you personally uh, visit or hang out with any of your crew members? Yes, yeah, we still keep in touch. Um, unfortunately, my, uh, my commander passed away uh, two years ago in an accident, but we still keep in touch with his wife and family. Um, the, my, my commander, Jim, uh, we love to hang out with his family. He's got five, uh, four boys, so it's a lot of energy. A um, couple of us live in Houston, so we still see each other. Stephanie still works in the office next door to me, so we go hang out you know, at least once a week together. Um, and I don't get to see Naoko very much because she's back in Japan and has retired from the Japanese Space Agency. But I try to keep in touch with her over Facebook. And, and uh, she's got two daughters, too. So um, we, it, you definitely become like a small family and you keep in touch with each other. I think that's part of what is really awesome about training as a team is that you get to know each other so much. And you have jokes, inside jokes, and you, you, do, you pull practical pranks on each other. Uh, but you take care of each other, too. Yes. Did any of y'all get motion sickness on the launch? I sure did get motion sickness. Yeah, I did not on the launch itself, but actually I got um, space sickness, which is caused um, because your neurovestibular system, which is partly uh, partly your muscles sensing um, gravity, is partly your vision, and it's partly your inner ear, which has the ability to um, to sense when you're moving around and when you're spinning and what direction you're at, and because there's no gravity in space to help with your inner ear, you get a little discombobulated and your body reacts to that differently. It's different for all sorts of folks. For me personally, it caused um, vomiting. So I, I would get like a wave of nausea, I'd have to go vomit, and then I'd feel much better and I'd get back to work and then, oh no, a couple minutes later I'd get sick again. And so the first day was, um, it was a, you know, it wasn't the best day. It wasn't the worst either. I was still able to get my job done, but um, I was sure glad when the, the next day came. Because once the next day came, once I slept, it was like my body kind of reset itself. The sleep kind of helped me just adapt to being in space. So then I felt much better. Yeah. Yes. What do you learn in space? What do you learn? Say it one more time. What do you learn in space? What do we learn? And lots of stuff, you know, there's stuff that you already kind of know, um, but, but you get to actually see it from outer space, and that, that was really rewarding. For, for me as a geologist, it was awesome to look down at Earth, and I know how a lot of these mountain ranges are created, and um, the plate boundaries, and see those, but to see it from outer space, and to see where, um, you know, mountain ranges like the Appalachians, where they're all folded up, you could see that on a grand scale, that was really amazing. Um, to actually see the Milky Way without having the atmosphere interfere and have all the night lights from our cities interfere, um, it was that was incredible too. And then I learned a little bit about the payloads that were on our mission. We had um, one payload that uh, was outside um, that was studying materials that what materials work best in space because the space environment is very harsh. You see extreme temperatures 
and um, you have different uh, fuels that sometimes burn on your solar arrays or get on your solar arrays as a vehicle is docking. So um, the, you have to have special materials that work in space. So they had a, 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 a test of all these different materials, and we brought that inside and we brought that home. And so it was interesting to learn, you know, about the study of materials in space. Um, there was another experiment that they are doing uh, vaccinations on and, and learning how we can, um, see, so our immune system is uh, suppressed when we're in space. That means we're more able to get sick when we're in space. And so we're trying to understand how to boost our immune system. And uh, they were working on a vaccine, um, not for humans up there, but they were looking at improving vaccines um, on our flight too. So there was a chance to learn a little bit about the payloads um, but also to just put into application things you already knew, but you could see it uh, for real, not just hear about it in textbooks or from lectures. Yes? No, in our launch we did not lose contact with mission control. In fact, that would be an abort criteria. So um, there's many places along the, the way in that lead up to launch that you would abort the launch and um, the only time you can't abort is once the solid rocket bo boosters light. So then we do have a procedure. If you did lose comm, there's a series of things you would do to regain comm. And we have a redundancy system, and we have multiple antennas that work. Um, so we have different radios. We have a UHF radio. Um, we have a very high frequency radio. So we have all these redundancies that would allow us to reestablish communication. Yes. Whenever you first got the space shuttle, it really weird to like. It sure did feel weird to walk, and in fact, at night, it felt weird to lay down on a bed. I felt like I was stuck to my bed, and I could not get up off it, because I wasn't used to gravity at that point, so it did feel a little bit weird. But within a couple of days, about two or three days later, I was back up running, and you know, you're walking around after the flight, but you just have to walk around slowly, because again, like I talked about that neurovestibular system, your balance is off. So we did an um, experiment, actually, where they wanted to see just how badly our sense of balance and direction was off. So they blindfolded us, and you know, before flight, if you close your eyes, you can stand here for a while, you kind of adjust, like if you start to lean forward, your feet kind of adjust, and you, you if after a while, you kind of start to lean over and stuff and lose your balance, but it takes a while before um, you lose your balance when you shut off your vision. When I returned home from space flight, it was like instantaneous. Like I closed my eyes and I just about knocked out the nurse behind me falling over. So um, your body has to readapt, but it does because your brain is, is pretty amazing and it, it quickly uh, readapts. Yes? What was your favorite part about the trip? What was my favorite part about the trip? Um, well, personally, my favorite part was watching out the window and floating. Because floating, I'm never going to be able to do here on Earth again, other, in, other than in a swimming pool. But it's just not quite the same. So I really liked floating, and I really loved looking out the window. So that was personally. Um, from a professional side, I think the days that we did the spacewalks were my favorite days, because I was um, the person in charge of talking to everyone. So I was kind of like the air traffic control person, making sure we all were in good communication, where we knew where the space walkers were at, were at, we knew where the robotic arm was at. We were working together as a team, and we were, we were not missing any steps. And so that was really a rewarding day, because it was all that teamwork coming together. Yes? What type of things were you allowed to bring up there? Yeah, we are allowed just a few personal items. Like we get like a small little portion of a drawer of our own personal things. So for my high school, I flew uh, my, our mascot. Um, I flew some banners for some schools that I had gone to when I was growing up. Um, I, I flew a, a, a necklace with my wedding ring on it. And uh, I'm trying to think what else. I flew a couple flat Stanleys for friends. So <laughs> that was fun. Um, some of the hardest parts about living in space is taking care of yourself because um, here on Earth we're just expect like the everyday things like we can take a shower and it's easy. You walk in the shower, you turn on the water, and there you are getting clean. Well, in orbit there isn't a shower and water wouldn't come out like in just one direction. It would hit your head and be bouncing all over the place, making a huge mess. So you have to be able to take care of yourself in a different way. So. Um, to take a shower, you have to either use a water pouch bag and squeeze water onto your scalp, or like we had a little hose that you could direct water on your scalp. Then you took a comb and combed that water through your hair, 
Then you had some uh, no rinse shampoo and you kind of worked that through your hair. And then because the no rinse shampoo <coughs> kind of feels sticky, you got a little bit more water, squeezed it through and took a comb and worked it through. But now you have all these hairs in your comb. And so there isn't like just a trash can nearby. You have to like take um, tape, wrap up the hair so that they don't go floating through the air and get in everyone else's way. And you got to make sure that they get down into a plastic bag that you clip shut. So it just takes a little while to take care of yourself. It's, it's not as easy as um, living here on Earth. And same thing like with your food. You know, you can go and prepare your food pretty easy in the oven or on a stove top. But we've had to do a lot of work to make food ready for orbit. So here on the ground, um, we have people in Houston that make food. Then they freeze dry it into proportion sizes. Then they have it packaged in these little pa plastic pouches. And then on orbit, we take those plastic pouches and we inject water into them and rehydrate the food, kind of let it be um, for five or ten minutes, let it rehydrate. Then you have to carefully cut open the pouches. And then what I found the easiest was using a spoon. Like We had forks and stuff, but um, a spoon was just easier to scoop everything and eat it that way. So um, even eating food is a little bit challenging. Yeah. How do you go to the bathroom? Uh, yeah, how do you go to the bathroom in space? Because that's what my students wanted to know when I was a teacher. So um, going to the bathroom for urine is we have a hose with a suction. And so you go into a funnel and it gets sucked away into a tank. And on the space station, that water is reused. Like that becomes your drinking water later because we have to conserve everything. So it sounds gross, but it actually is probably cleaner than the water you drink here on Earth. It's purified through many different filters, um, through a centrifuge process, and through a catalyst that heats it. So it, it, um, it is really purified water. Um, for, uh, for solid waste, um, it's, it's not as awesome. <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually kind of disgusting, but you have little bags that you go to the bathroom in, and you seal them off, and you have to squeeze them down into a a big metal container, and a metal container has a protection for odor so that the odors t don't come out, so it kind of helps reduce the odors, but um, eventually that tank fills up and then you put it onto one of our disposal vehicles, uh, we have orbital and progress vehicles that you put that onto and then they unberth and they burn up in the atmosphere and that's what happens to your waste. So that's how you go that. Hopefully, we're, we're working on making a next generation toilet that will work even better because we want to be going out into our solar system. And so, you don't want to be carrying waste with you out to the solar system. So, there's got to be some way to get rid of it out, like some sort of hatch or who knows what they'll come up with. But um, you don't want to be carrying that with you. Yeah, brushing your teeth. Um, so you can't spit into a sink. So you just put the toothpaste onto your toothbrush and you do all that part is normal, but then you have to have like some sort of washcloth to um, spit into or like a Kleenex so that you can spit into um, to that because you don't have a sink to spit into. Yes? Um, did you lose weight in space? Yeah, you do lose a little bit of weight in space um, because your heart you know, here on Earth, it works against gravity, and so it's pumping blood to the extremes of your body and up to your head. Well, when you get to space, it doesn't have to pump as hard, and so it starts to think um, that it doesn't need as much volume as you need down here on Earth, and so actually your kidneys filter out a lot of your blood, and you end up um, peeing out a lot of uh, water weight, and so you reduce a lot of your um, blood volume that way, and you lose a little bit of weight. Um, also, if you're not working out, which we make our astronauts work out two and a half hours a day, but if you didn't work out, you'd start to lose your muscle mass because you're not using your muscles. You're not walking around and fighting gravity. You're not running. Um, and so your leg muscles especially start to atrophy, but so do all the other muscles in your body. Um, so you can lose weight that way. You also start to lose bone mass in space. And again, if you're not working out the two and a half hours a day and doing those resistive exercises like you saw my commander doing. It looked like he was weightlifting, but he was actually um, pulling against a vacuum um, or pushing against a vacuum, and that was an equivalent of weightlifting. If you don't do that, then your bones start to lose mass, about 1% to 2% per month. So it's like you have osteoporosis. So um, it's really important to exercise in space. And again, that's why we do two and a half hours a day on orbit. So. 
pretty cool. Yes. How do you wash your hands in space? Washing your hands in space? Well, um, we have uh, like we have a lot of huggy wet wipes that we use. You do have water in pouches with a little bit of soap in it because it's really important again to stay clean in space as clean as possible. The good thing is you don't have dirt available to get you dirty, but you do. Uh, you are sweating and. You're touching greases that are on some of the equipment and things like that. So you, you do get a little bit dirty. And so that's how you get yourself clean. And you want to stay clean because um, you don't want to get any rashes or anything that could make you sick in space. Because again, our immune system is suppressed. And so it's important not to, um, to get sick in space. Yeah, it could, it could be very bad for your mission. Any questions? Yeah. Did you uh, enjoy the nighttime view better or the morning view better of here? Wow, that's a hard question. That would be a toss-up because I love looking at the earth um, and I really love seeing like desert colors like the Sahara was this really beautiful orangish brown. But I also enjoy astronomy and um, i would never seen the Milky Way so clear and like I remember the phases of the moon. We were up there with a uh, waning crescent and then an early waxing crescent and it was really awesome to catch that moon against a really stark black background. Um, you know here on earth because we have the atmosphere between us and the stars and the planets it makes the stars look like they're twinkling and it makes the planets even have a little bit of a twinkle to them but when you're in space you're away from that atmosphere so you don't see that twinkle so that it just looks amazing. It's really amazing. Now you're not that much closer, so nothing appears closer. People always ask me, like, could you see the planets better? But you see the planets about the same as on Earth. They just don't twinkle. Yes? You said you had difficulties on that one mission. Did you have any more? I only had one space mission. Um, I've done a mission under the ocean, actually. I lived underwater for uh, 11 days with a crew off of Florida. And, uh, and we... Um, we didn't have too many problems there, but uh, we had a, a little bit more day-to-day -day struggles because we knew that we're just, we were living at 65 feet under the ocean. But it's a good, the ocean is a good analog, especially for doing spacewalks. So we were practicing sp doing spacewalks as if we were at an asteroid and taking samples of an asteroid to bring back to Earth, because that's something that we're looking at doing. Yes? Which mission did you like better, underwater or in space? I liked both of them. They're both really interesting environments. And in fact, we know just about as little, well, we, we know almost more about space than we do about some of the deep parts of our ocean. So um, living at 65 feet, you know, we, we know a lot about that part of the ocean. But it was incredible each day to go out in this big uh, diving gear. We, we were helmet diving. And uh, to um, work with, like, you'd be doing work and practicing as if you're doing a spacewalk. But then all of a sudden, like, a ray would go by. Yeah, that was really interesting. So I enjoyed both missions, but space was really incredible, so I'd still put it number one. Yes. Well, did you see any, like, any, like, other, other, like, hurricanes? Yeah. Well, we didn't see any major hurricane storm systems because we were in the early, we were in April, so we weren't during hurricane season. But we saw some major lightning storms. And uh, one that I particularly remember was on the day that we had undone from the space station, and so we were just the shuttle all by ourselves. And we had our payload bay pointed down towards the earth. And there was a big lightning storm. And it started to light up the payload bay like a purple color. So it was really beautiful. But I mean, this is amazing because we're 200 miles above the earth and we're receiving the light from earth. So that's cool. All right, yes. who's got the last question? Well, so you just got the last okay. question, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, are you going to ever like, go back to space or back to the um, earth? My plan is not to go back to space because I have a daughter and so I'm going to spend some time with her. But I'm excited for my friends at NASA, my astronaut friends, to go back and do their missions. So I'm going to support them. Yeah. Well, thanks, you guys. You guys have really good questions. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Um, I hope that you've learned some new things. I hope you continue to, to set your goals high, whatever they are, um, to always keep working towards them. And you know, as you're working towards them, you'll really enjoy life too. You'll meet lots of friends and you'll have adventures along the way. So set your goals high, um, keep enjoying school. I hope you enjoy math and science. It's, it's challenging, it's sometimes not easy. Um, sometimes you have to ask for help, for sure, but it's rewarding. So take care and thanks for, for being here today.